Hey everybody, it's Jay Bear, and I'm joined today by a very special guest, uh, entrepreneur, author, motivational speaker, international <laughs> gadabout, Derek Sivers, <laughs> who uh, wrote the fantastic uh, new book, Anything You Want, 40 Lessons for a New Kind of Entrepreneur. That's not actually Derek, as you can tell, but uh, that's the cover of the book. It's part of um, uh, Seth Godin's uh, Domino Project, which is a joint venture between uh, Seth's company and, uh, and Amazon. Um, it's an unbelievable book. I just read it uh, a few days ago, and Derek was nice enough to join me uh, for an interview. Derek, how's it going? How's the book doing? Good. Thanks, Jay. And you know what's funny? is actually I had already stopped doing most interviews like I kind of have a form letter now when people want to do an interview I'm like no I'm sorry I'm really just focused on my next thing now but uh I checked out your site and I just I love what you're doing and I just I love your style and everything I was like yeah you know what I'm making an exception this thank time you. so I'm I'm really happy to be here thank you I appreciate that very much I uh I'm a former sort of indie music uh, guy myself. I started the, the radio station at my college, University of Arizona, mm -hmm. uh, nice. and so was a CD Baby fan from way, 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 oh. way back, uh, back when it was just a tiny thing. And it's just an, an amazing story. Um, you know, uh, most successful businesses, right, are based on the premise of sort of doing something that, um, that that their customers like, they've never heard of. And you certainly did that with CD Baby, but it's sort of a weird, almost backwards tale, because you didn't even try to start a company, right? You sort of accidentally yeah. started a company. So for people who might not be familiar with CD Baby or your story, could, could you kind of run through that a little bit for folks? Sure, of course. Um, so when I was 14, I decided I wanted to be a musician, like like really be a professional musician, not just rock star dreams, but I really was determined to be a full-time, make my living doing music kind of guy. So I did it, right? So I was... Uh, very focused on this, and, and uh, when I was 27 or so, um, I was selling my CDs at live shows, and then I started a website to sell my CD because back in 1997, there was no way to sell your CD online. Uh, there was no PayPal, Amazon was just a bookstore, and all of the big online record stores at the time were really just front ends to the major label distribution system. So if you were just a guy with a CD, there was no way to sell it online. So I went and did the hard work to like build a shopping cart and put together this and get a credit card merchant account, which again in 1997 yeah. was pretty hard. Right. And um, so when I was done, I had a buy now button on my website. It was a huge accomplishment. But then some of my musician friends in New York said, oh, hey, man, do you think you could sell my CD through that thing? And I went, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. All right. So just as a favor, I started hooking up friends and uh, – giving them the same thing I had done for myself. And then more and more friends called, and pretty soon it's just like uh, friends of friends, and then people announced it on their newsletters, and then all these requests started pouring in. So it's really kind of interesting when, uh, like, you, like, I didn't mean to start a business, but just demand grew anyway. Yeah. And, and partway along the way, I realized, oops, I've started something that's taking off. So it really, honestly, man, I'm, I was never a like a, a, a business-minded person that set out to do this thing. I was yeah. a little like Forrest Gump. You remember like, yeah, yeah. Forrest Gump, everything just kind of happens to him and he just stumbles into things. And so it's kind of like that. I had uh, the uh, I had the same accidental company circumstance in college. I started making fake IDs for friends. Uh, nice. I was in the fake ID business. Um, and uh, it all of a sudden got to be kind of a big deal. It was, you know, hook up a friend, same kind of experience. And then I was yeah. at a bar one time, and I heard a bouncer say, man, there's a lot of kids from Idaho at this school. Uh, and I wow. decided that maybe that was the time to get out of that business. So I got out, uh, I got out while the getting was good. Uh, <laughs> you know, sometimes you don't want to grow the company when it ends up uh, uh, being uh, jail time. Yeah. <laughs> you, <laughs> yeah, and there's a lesson. There's a you. lesson. That is going to be the lesson <laughs> in my entrepreneurial book. You uh, obviously come at it, right, from a, from a different perspective because a lot of the people that you know and that you hang out with now are – that sort of core driven entrepreneur start a lot of things, you know, that's, that's in their DNA, right? So do you think, um, knowing people on both sides that on the whole, it's better, um, to, to sort of accidentally start a business or better to go about it in a very sort of methodical planned way? I'd actually say better accidentally, but no, I think it – okay, I think the distinction is this because, of course, we can't just all make it a life's mission to have accidents happen. Um, so I think it's when when the world seems to be like kind of saying, yes, I want that, 
um, those are the things you should do. And if the world does not seem to be saying yes to what you're offering, it means you need to change your offering, not keep persistently doing something that's not working. Yeah. So this was a huge lesson learned in hindsight because, okay, we tell the fun bit of the story like when I started CD Baby, but for 12 years yeah. before that, I had tried everything and it, it, things weren't working. I tried to start a record label. I started a recording studio. I was a touring band. I was a touring five-piece band, one-piece band, two-piece band. Um, I'm sure I even did some other crazy stuff. Oh, I did. I did music for film and TV like once, and that wasn't working too well. So all that stuff, I kept persistently trying to push it, full of intention and plans and well thought out plans, but it just wasn't. Um, I just wasn't getting good feedback from yes. the marketplace. Let's say people weren't into it. So then all of a sudden, one of the many things I did completely took off. Right. So. Um, I think there, there's a lesson in that, that that we need to pay close attention to what the world is responding to yeah. and do more of that. And yeah. kind of just instead of thinking only of our intentions, like, well, the world's asking me to, to do this other thing, but I don't want to do that because this is my plan. It's yeah. like, well, right. the world's asking you to do this. Listen to it. Yeah. Um, so sorry, that's that's not quite a sound bite. No, it's, it's, it's perfect. Yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned that because um, you don't talk as much in the book about sort of your, your sort of litany of, I don't want to call them failures, but, but less spectacular successes. Um, and so it's good to have that frame of reference, right? That, that it wasn't, um, uh, you know, it wasn't just magic, right? It, it, it yeah. ultimately worked out. And, and, what, and what I always tell people, uh, and, and I presume that you'll agree, that a lot of what you learn being an entrepreneur is what you don't like, right? It's almost a process of elimination <laughs> rather, rather than a process yes. of finance. It's like, okay, I know that sucks. I know that sucks. I know that sucks. And what you're left with is something awesome. It's a reductive process rather than a discovery process. You're the first person I've heard say that, and I so agree. That's so true. I love it. Yes. But, but you don't realize that until you get a little older, right? When you're 25, <laughs> you haven't seen enough disasters to, mm -hmm. to sort of figure that out, you know? Well, that's, you know, honestly, man, the... I took the same approach to dating. I was sure. Saying, I would just, of course, I would just yeah. go out with anybody, everybody. Yeah. And like even, you know, somebody that whatever. And, uh, and you start to learn through each person you, you go out with, you're like, oh, now I know I don't want that. No, I definitely do not want a TV addict. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't exactly. want somebody who likes to party Check, all yeah, the time. Yeah. No. And, <laughs> And eventually you narrow down what you do want. That yeah. I did not do. That, that I did not do. I, uh, I, I found my wife first day, first class in college. Oh, my God. Uh, and, and I figured I was punching so far above my weight class at that time that I had to close <laughs> that deal as quickly as possible. That there was going to be no other circumstances for me. Uh, that, that, and it worked out. I'm, I'm, uh, I awesome. married way, way, way up. <laughs> One of the things that I love about about your style and your story is that throughout the whole history of CD Baby, partially because you started it somewhat accidentally, you you almost purposefully kept it smaller, right? You almost went out of your way to, to I don't want to say not grow the business, but you certainly didn't yeah. do all the things you could have done to grow it, which is so counter to all of the entrepreneurial culture, certainly in the U.S., where People yeah. are there's almost like this undercurrent that says if you're not growing it, you're lazy or you're not trying right. hard enough, right? Which really right. is irksome to me. How were you able to just toe the line on that through that? I mean, you're talking about an eight or ten year period. It's exactly what we what we were talking about just before. It's like I, I noticed what I did and didn't want, and yeah. so luckily I was living in New York City and I had other entrepreneur friends that say they had investors and a board of directors and a sure. hundred employees and I'd look at their life and be like, eh, God, that's awful. Like they're always telling me about having to please the investors or put together a presentation for the board of directors. I'm like, sorry, but fuck that. Like yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. not the yeah. life I want. Yeah. Um, and so I was really glad that I got to see those bad examples of, uh, and know what I didn't want. So, um, yeah, I was just like, so investors would come calling. You know, I started CD Baby before the big dot com boom. Right. So of course, during the dot com boom, which all these people are trying to get <laughs> wait, a company that's revenue positive, call those guys. <laughs> yes, exactly. And so they were calling a lot, and I ended up just kind of 
I ended up just telling customer service to just handle it. Like, look, when somebody calls and they say they're an investor and they want to invest, just send them a CD. Tell them, yeah. Don't even send them to me anymore. Just tell <laughs> them no. And like, just yeah. say, we don't want any. Thank you. Goodbye. Uh, and that's what we did for 10 years. They, yeah. did, they didn't even send me the calls. I love it because I just knew that I didn't. And every now and then, like one would say, get me at a conference or something, and they'd say, "Well, but don't you realize that you could you could grow your company, you know, with with the right amount of capital infusion, but whatever, you could grow this thing." And I was like, "I don't want it to grow." Yeah. And they would just look at me like, yeah. "Huh?" They would end the conversation really fast. I loved it. Yeah, it's like being from Mars, right? Yeah. Well, but but that's that's what I love about your uh, overall sort of thesis that that is woven throughout the book is that. You and I, and I take this to be very uh, sincere just in, in, in reading your stuff and, and having a couple of brief interactions with you. You really do uh, make decisions based on your happiness and what's going to make your customers and, and loved ones happy, which of yeah. course sounds self-evident uh, to everybody, but that's not the way the world usually works, unfortunately. Yeah. And, and it takes, I think, um, uh, quite a bit of backbone to say, you know what? I'm going to do what makes me happy regardless of what the financial circumstances are or any other circumstances. Yeah. I think it, it, again, it helps that I saw, say when I was in the music business, I mean, when I was more directly in the, when I worked at Warner Brothers, uh, when I was 20 years old, I got a job at Warner Brothers. And so for two and a half years, I worked there and I met a lot of miserable rock stars, like people who had, say, set out to be a rock star when they had, were 17 they had achieved it when they were 27. Now they're a big rock star, but they're 35. And you got the feeling like it was probably time for a life change for them, but they were trapped. In fact, they were still following their 17-year-old trajectory when you could tell that they were miserable, but they wouldn't stop doing it. Yeah. And then I've also met some miserable, angry multimillionaires. Sure. Uh, and I just, luckily I just saw these lessons early enough. It's like, those people are not happy. Like it's, it can't come down to that. It's not just get as big as you can, as famous as you can, and then you'll be happy. No, I think I've found proof that that's not true. So instead you just have to, you know what it is? Okay. But you have to find what, what your personal set point is. So there are some people like say Richard Branson is, seems truly happy being a no kidding, right? multi-billionaire. Happy, happy, happy like billionaire. It's amazing. That guy. Yeah. It's like even a billion isn't enough for him. He wants yeah. to have 10 billion because yeah. Hey, it's fun. Yeah. So like that's his natural set point yep. is way up there. To me, it's um, it's like I just found it. Like no, I'm happier here. Like I don't yep. want the pressure of a billion dollars. And in fact, I think anything beyond a million or so won't make me more happy. <laughs> you know what's funny now is so you know the joke was before we had the uh, yeah. Doctor Evil. Yeah. Um. Now to me the joke is the. This, the movie The Social Network. That's right. That's right. That's right. It's, it's taken over. Man, it's the same. It's the same um, line. It's taken over. It's the postmodern. It's the postmodern cool. version of this, right? Well, except so my my little punchline to this is that I've been telling a lot of entrepreneurs now is. I know so many entrepreneurs that are trying to be the next Facebook. They're trying to invent something that is so huge and all-encompassing that every living person is going to use, and it's going to make billions of dollars because they've seen the social network. and, and One you know, of those whatever. ever. Yeah. Justin Timberlake told them that yeah. uh, that a million dollars isn't cool. So now I think the reverse. It's like, hey, you know what? A billion dollars isn't cool. You know what's cool? A million dollars. <laughs> like five hundred like bucks in free food is awesome. <laughs> yes. If you do something that like makes a thousand people happy, yeah. that's actually cooler than doing something that makes a billion people happy. Like find something that a thousand people would think is really cool. Like find a niche yep. and like aim for small things and it's like that's much cooler than trying to please everyone. Absolutely. One of the things that I think was really smart in terms of how you handled the, the growth of the company, um, even though you didn't really want it, was systematizing your processes and sort of taking yourself out of the day-to-day, -day, uh, sort of that, that e-myth philosophy of, okay, let's let's get this to the point that I am working on the business, um, not, not in the business. Did that happen to you intentionally or accidentally? Like, was it chicken or the egg? So did you say, I've got to build systems so I can get out of the company, or did you get out of the day-to-day -day and say, oh, now let's build systems to replace me? I built systems so I could get out of the day-to-day. -day. Okay, so you and again, did the systems, yeah. Yeah, but it came, from, it came from a couple motivations. So for one, it was the, um, the, the happiness thing we were just talking about. I noticed that I got to this point where I would go to the office, and even though I had looked forward to having a productive day, 
focused on some real creative work and say like inventing a new part of the website and programming and focusing. Instead, it's like every five minutes, one of my employees would be like, hey, Derek, there's this guy on the phone that wants to know. He sent his CDs and he needs to know if we can send them back now. What do I tell him? And I'm like, ah, and I'd say, okay, tell him this and this and that. And then five minutes later, yeah. uh, hey, Derek, you know, we, we ran out of those postage supplies. How can, I, can I get some more? I'm like, okay, do this. And, and I found it's like every five minutes all day long I was interrupted because uh, my employees didn't yeah. know how to do everything. Everything was dependent on me. And I was just, dude, I was hating my life. I was just like, I hate this. I just, I want to get out. I don't want to go to the office anymore. Or then I was like getting angry, like, well, why don't I just go to the office and just put a stool in the middle of the hallway and just sit there all day and answer, <laughs> answer questions. questions? That'll yeah. be my full-time job. Brr. So I was like, okay, hold on. I got to come up with a better solution to this. So, um, so that's when I realized, like, I need to teach everybody how to do everything without me. Because the only way I'll get some kind of peace and quiet to do the important things, like not the urgent things, but the things that will actually make a big difference in the, the business, are to stop doing those little petty urgent things. And the way to stop doing those is to teach everybody else how to do them. So to me, it was really, and it was one of those like epiphany nights, you know, those, those nights where you just kind of like a light bulb goes off and you go, yeah, so like I went back to work that next day, like after just this bleak, miserable night of hating everything about the company and wanting to get rid of it. Um, I went back to the work the next day. I was like, all right, I'm going to teach everybody how to do everything without me. And I did. And it took like six months of hard work to kind of show everybody how to do everything without me. But it was very worth it. And, and in addition to sort of personal satisfaction that you derived from changing what you had to tackle, did you see sort of disproportionate company results because it worked more efficiently? Huge, huge. Uh, I mean, it's never fair to just use one little one guy's example of this. Like, who knows what aspect of this was because of what I had done. But um, to me, the final step in my delegation was uh, just after I had spent six hard months kind of delegating everything to my team, I, for the most part, was not necessary to the business anymore. And then my girlfriend moved to L.A. and I was up in Portland, Oregon. She went down there for film school. And um, I thought... Yeah, I think that might actually be my final step is to move away as proof as to make sure that these things are running without me. Yeah. So I won't even be there. So yeah, I moved to LA when my business was in Portland. I just told everybody, "All right, guys, you're on your own. If you need me, here's my phone number." But uh, other than that, you're on your own. And I was down in LA for six years, and in uh, yeah, six, yeah, something like that, four, maybe five. In those five years, um, the business grew from like like 1 million in revenue to about 80 million in revenue yeah. while I was gone <laughs> and grew from 20 employees yeah. to 85 employees. Like yeah. I, I taught them how to hire too. Um, so they were just free to hire even without consulting with me. Uh, and yeah, the business just grew without me. It was awesome. Fantastic. I, I did the same thing. I actually moved out of town uh, oh, cool. when I run a company. Um, it's, it's hard though. It's, it's hard to, it's hard to pull that plug. Definitely. You know, I think the biggest lesson learned for, for anybody who's listening to this that would love to do the same thing, the my kind of succinct bit of advice is to get used to the concept of good enough. It's like if you are the business founder and you're used to doing everything yourself and micromanaging, yeah. it's because you want everything to be perfect. Yeah. You just have to realize along the way that there's a point where if you want everything to be perfect, yeah. you're it's never going to be able to grow that way. So at a certain point, you just learn to say, all right, good enough. You know what like, I find, though? It's not even it's not even perfect. It's you mm -hmm. want it done the way you do it. The, yeah. the, assumption is, the assumption there is that you do it better. And I don't think that's always true. It's just the way that right. you know how to do it. And so you, you know, it's, it's a little bit, I think, of um, uh, sort of self-congratulatory to think, okay, the way I do it is by definition the best way. And I've always... Uh, had a lot of luck with saying, you know what, I'm just going to let you do it however you want to do it. And sometimes people do it better than I did. I just didn't realize there was another yep. way, you know? Yeah, you're right. Exactly. That's really well put. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I listened to the podcast you did with uh, with Mitch Joel recently, who uh, is fantastic, obviously, at Twist Image. And he interviewed uh, myself and my co-author for our book uh, a couple of months cool. ago. I love Mitch. And it was a great interview. W one of the things that he mentioned, just almost as an aside in your interview with him, was – um, you're obviously a big proponent of just kind of, you know, do, try stuff, right? You tried a lot of things before CD Baby. You're involved in a lot of uh, different projects now. And Mitch sort of made the point that 
when you have something going, like in his case, you know, a large agency, etc., that that notion of trying something is very attractive, but it comes with an opportunity cost based on what you're currently doing. How do you how do you look at that? It's I mean, I, there's a lot. I have a long list of things I want to do. So does Mitch. But you end up not doing some of those things because you've got to do the things that you're already doing, right? You've got to run the company you've already built. Hmm. Um, actually, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, so how do you get how do you get out of how do you get out of what you're doing day to day in your current company in order to experiment with different projects? I guess is the best way to say that. Well, there's the. I mean, the, of course, there's this thing that I, I just said about like learning to set up your company so it doesn't need you anymore yeah. so that you're yeah. really free to just do yeah. the future stuff. But even then it's like, I don't know if I have found a good solution to like how to narrow down what to do. There's always, there's this idea that um, whatever the world responds to the yeah. most and needs to the most, like you almost let the world decide yeah. uh, what right. to do. Uh, but then again, I could see somebody using that and getting kind of trapped. Like, well, the world wants me to keep showing up to my stupid job I hate. <laughs> you know? And yeah. So, um, I guess it is that kind of that mix of what is the world asking you to do the most versus, like, what do you love and hate doing? Sorry yeah, about I, I mean, I, I love the sentiment in your book, the, the sort of hell yeah sentiment, right? That that if, right. if there's something you really want to do, uh, you'll know it. And, and if it makes you say yeah. hell yeah, do it. And if it's anything short of that, if it's more like meh, don't do it, right? And, and exactly. I think, I think it's a really good credo. It's almost like love, right? You know, people always ask, mm. "How do you know when you're in love?" You'll know. Uh, yeah. and, and I'm starting to feel the same way about business, right? I, I'm fortunate yeah. enough to get a lot of opportunities, and so does Mitch and you. And and it's 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 great to people ask, "Do you want to do this or do that?" But I think you know inherently when it's awesome, um, or you'll know pretty quickly. And and I think that's one of the things that needs to guide your behavior. Yeah, you know that the. Hell yeah or no is a wonderful rule of thumb that I've been using. I, I use it almost every single day. Even somebody yeah. says like, hey, you know, that girl we met once at a party, she's having some people over for dinner. Do you want to go? I'm like, eh. <laughs> and, and so anytime I catch myself going, eh, and it's like, oh, okay, hold on. I'm feeling on the fence. So no, just yeah. say no. Like say no so much so that you just have all this room in your life so that when something comes along, like, hey, would you like to – fly to New York and have dinner with Seth Godin. It's like, hell yeah. And it's like, yeah. now you're able to do that because you said no to all this other stuff. You're free to do that. Um, it's my only thing to add to that is to don't forget though, that often the things that scare you right. are also what you should be doing. It's like another rule of thumb of mine. It's like, whatever scares you go do it. So sometimes there's the, there's the simple achievable thing and then there's the giant, like, oh, my God, no way. There's no way I could ever do that. Could I? And you, like, if, if it seems almost out of your league, uh, like your wife, um, <laughs> right. Right. then um, that's what you should be doing. Uh, and and I'm, I'm trying to learn that lesson myself. Like, sorry, that this almost gets, like, a little, like, personal and, and confessional here, but it might be useful to people, is I still have things that I feel like are within my realm, like starting another website, and then there are things that just feel like I'm not that kind of person. So say like starting a resort in the Caribbean. Like I don't know who those people Hell are yeah. do something like that. Hell yeah. <laughs> but it's like I can't – like I'm not that kind of person. I couldn't do it. Starting a resort, no, that's something that very professional, wise, and rich people do. Like that's not something I could do. And uh, it's funny, man. I read Tony Robbins' book when I was 19 called Awaken the Giant Within. Yeah. And he mentions in that book that he has a resort in Fiji. And at the time, like, I was 19 and he was an adult to me. And so he was maybe somebody, okay, well, he can have a resort in Fiji. I'm just 19. I'm a musician. But the funny thing is, looking back now, I'm 41, and I think he was 27 when he wrote that book. And now I'm like, no way. It's like, now I can think this 27-year-old kid started yeah, a, had resort a resort in Fiji. Fiji. Like, what the hell? Yeah. And so sometimes it's like I, I have to like adjust my self-image of what I'm able to do. Uh, and I'm still in the process of doing that. So uh, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. It might be because I'm, I'm 41 as well. And so you sort of get to that hmm. stage in your life where you sort of have to recalibrate what your own personal expectations are. And, and I had yeah. very – I really had no goals for myself – to speak of, um, uh, this is, you know, my fifth or sixth company, but, but similar mm -hmm. to you, I think, you know, you wanted to be a musician and I wanted to 
help people with marketing and now sort of fast mm-hmm. forward, fast forward, fast forward. And it's like, oh, well, okay, now what's the next sort of hill to climb? Right. Which is, you know, you, it, it, so the best you, album, the best album name of all time is, is this it, right? Because that's, mm. that's, that's how, you know, you, you end up feeling sometimes it's like, okay, I've accomplished that now. Is no. that, the, is that the limit of my accomplishments? You know? Right. You know, there's something I did really consciously when I sold CD baby and I had this, and for those of you who have never sold a company, uh, it's a weird thing. It's, it's, uh, I've started describing it as a, um, it's a cross, it, it's like getting divorced and graduating college and winning the lottery on the same day. Exactly. It's yeah. really these like conflicted feelings, like this feeling of loss that you're no longer with yeah. your company, but you got a bunch of money and that's nice and you feel like you've graduated to a new level. But so it's kind of in dealing with that, um, I went and did a bunch of stuff that like very consciously trying to change my trajectory. Because what I'd actually done is the day after I sold CD Baby, I set up my next company, Muckwork. And I set up the website. I threw myself into it. I spent a few months programming it. And then I kind of had to say, like, what am I doing? Like, I'm, I'm just – I'm not changing my trajectory. Like, here's my trajectory. And, yes, I sold CD Baby, but am I just kind of replacing the company name over my head? Right. Like, okay, take down right. that logo, put up a new logo, right. and keep doing the same thing? It's like, no, hold on. Like, I want to make a change in my life. Like, I don't even know what the change is, but I know it's not just doing the exact same thing because I'll burn out. So I started doing this intentional process of, of, I I call it like, say yes to everything you used to say no to. Say no to everything you used to say yes to. It's Costanza. Yes, exactly. It's like, it's about being more impulsive. That's so cute. I can't believe you got that. (laughs) I'm just going to do the opposite of whatever I used to do. So, um, but I started doing things like, um, like on a Tuesday, I was reading the Wikipedia page about Iceland. I was like, God, look at that. It looks gorgeous. It's beautiful. I'd never even been there. never even thought about going there. I was like, I'm going to book a flight. And by that Friday, I was on a flight to Iceland. And then I'm in Iceland, and I see a really deep lake that's crystal clear. I'm like, I want to go in. And somebody says, oh, they teach scuba diving lessons here. I'm like, yes, that's what I'm going to do. It's like I've never scuba dived before. Like, I'm going to learn to scuba dive. And then it's like, I'm going to learn how to, you know, whatever. It's like... I think it's it's changing your – it's this kind of intentional scrambling of your self-identity to realize that it's, you can be anything that you weren't before. Uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, because otherwise you get constrained by, by your own history. No question about yes, it. Yes. Uh, well, I'm not the kind of person that does that. That's not, that doesn't sound like me. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, you mentioned Iceland. You've lived in a ton of places in, in your life, and you live in Singapore now. Um, does your physical location have an impact on sort of your ideas and how you approach life and business? I mean, are you the same person wherever you are in the world, Carmen San Diego, or, or sort of where, where you are, does that have a visceral, meaningful impact on your thought process? Good question. I think mostly you're the same person no matter where, but... Say, for example, to me, the biggest change is I was living on the beach in Santa Monica, California. Um, beautiful, weather's always perfect, and uh, I would ride my bike on the beach, and it was just, uh, the weather's always 68 degrees. I had this gorgeous house overlooking the ocean. Everything was perfect. But then I went to a, a friend's wedding in New York City, <clears throat> and um, we get off the train at Penn Station. And all of a sudden, I'm in the middle of Penn Station, New York City, and I'm surrounded by a thousand people from like all over the world. I was like, I just like love this kind of adrenaline of the moment. But it was also the the diversity of the thing, um, meaning that Santa Monica, California, is one of my favorite places in the world. But like, sorry, but everybody's white and everybody's pretty rich. Um, it's a little bit like the other Beverly Hills. Yeah. And New York City is this melting pot of just like everybody's from all over the world and and everybody's together on the the subway trains rich or poor you're shoulder to shoulder you're shoulder to shoulder with a a couple from korea and a man from russia and a guy from nigeria and you're all together on the train and there is something about this like this mix of ideas and getting different points of view and not getting stuck you don't want to get stuck in your little uh whatever you call it like echo bubble where everybody agrees with you I hate that. I don't want to be in a place where everybody agrees with me. 
because then you just get such a feeling of righteousness. Or where like, everybody's oh, in I'm the business, right. right? Where everybody's in the industry, which happens certainly in the entertainment yeah. business in LA and, yes. and in the tech business in, in you know, the Valley in San Francisco, exactly. where everybody's sort of like this groupthink mentality. Yeah. So that's why I intentionally, again, it's like talk about like changing your life. So up and moving to Singapore was another like, like going to Iceland. It was like a very intentional, I need to see the world from a different point of view. And Singapore in particular is pretty cool because, uh, you know, if I had moved to Tokyo, I'd be in a place where everybody's Japanese. And if I had moved to Beijing, everybody would be Chinese. But Singapore is an interesting little hub spot where it's like there are a lot of uh, Muslim people from Malaysia and Indonesia. There are a lot of Chinese people that moved here from China. There's a lot of people that moved here from India. And as you just like you – just, you just stand in the street of the subway and you just – you see like all different like beliefs and races and it's just it's really kind of encouraging and I, th I think it does uh, it sparks something in you where you can't ever think that you're just yeah you get out of that little bubble where you think that you're right <laughs> last question for you uh, social media sort of my my industry has you know changed the music business significantly right this mm -hmm. ability for for artists to communicate with their fans and, and stay in touch with them and those kind of things it almost is is a circumstance now where social media aptitude and technology comfort and those things are almost a prerequisite to be a successful band to 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 sort of come up out of nowhere. You really have to play that game very well. And there's of course many case studies of artists, both big and small, who have done that great. Do you feel that's ultimately a positive or or a negative for the music business? That sort of being good at social media and, and sort of being good at tech is almost you know a requirement to be a successful band it's almost like yeah write great songs play great guitar but also be awesome at facebook it just it, it almost like this whole other <laughs> this whole other piece of the story that didn't used to be there maybe it was there but yeah. just in a different way unfortunately i do think it's negative sorry oh no uh, I, I, it's um one of the most common bits of advice i give musicians uh Sometimes I think just to be kind of contrarian, um, but people often ask me, you know, what do you, what do you think I should be doing? One of my biggest bits of advice is I say, uh, turn off your computer. I say, what? I say, look, just like I know everybody's telling you the opposite. I know everybody's trying to tell you you should do this. You should sign up to their site. You should use their service. You should do this. You should sign up for that. It's like if you don't focus, it's all for naught, you know, like you need to turn off your damn computer and practice singing arpeggios. You need to turn off your computer and and do your uh, finger exercises on your guitar or your drums or whatever. You do your paradiddles on your snare drum. Like, if you don't learn how to shut out distraction, you're never going to get good at anything. And the world, I, I often think about this uh, thing about the take the path less followed, right? Um, so, if everybody else in the world is spending their life kind of clicking a mouse and looking at a screen and clicking things. And you are the one oddball who didn't do that and instead spends 11 hours a day singing arpeggios or whatever it may be, then you're going to be a unique, remarkable, precious talent in the world. Yeah. When everybody else is here, you are up here. Um, so, yeah, my biggest advice for musicians is to uh, turn off your computer and focus on what will really set you apart, what is really valuable to the world, and which is usually what are others not doing. Because if everybody else is doing it, then it's not valuable de by definition, you know, supply and demand. Um, so do the stuff that people are not doing. And as far as like Facebook, Twitter, like having your social media presence, I think that there's probably a way that either you could, if not get somebody else to do it, you can find a way to give yourself like a 15 minute deadline per day. Yeah. Give yourself 15 minutes, like from eight to eight fifteen. I will do social media today. And it's like, say, okay, you get any yes. Okay. Add friends, add friends. Okay. Do this. Okay. Tweet once a day. What I've been up to something from others might find interesting done eight fifteen. turn off your damn computer. Yeah. Get back to what's important. Yeah. Go practice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go uh, practice. Go practice. <laughs> Mow the lawn. Get <laughs> good. Awesome. <laughs> Derek, thanks very much. This has been uh, tremendous. I really appreciate your time and your wisdom and the gift of your book. It's a, it's a fantastic read. I hope people will pick it up. It's uh, Anything You Want from Derek Sibber, The Domino Project. <laughs> Enjoy Singapore. Thanks, Jay. I like your style. I love thanks, this buddy. conversation, and I'm just happy to be here. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Take care.